Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us to this data learning meeting. Today, we have Jisoo Kim, a postdoc researcher at Max Planck Institute. Uh, Jisoo has a PhD in data science. Uh, she got her PhD in a joint program with several institutes like um, uh, IMT and um, uh, Normale and the University of Pisa and others. And uh, she's talking about um, Twitter data as an alternative data source for international migration studies. So we are very happy to host her talk today. And uh, thanks for coming, Jisoo. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you so much, Rosella, for introducing me. And hello, everyone. So um, first of all, I am very happy to have this opportunity to talk about research today at the Deep Learning Working Group. Um, as Rosella said already, um, I'll be mainly talking about how Twitter data can be leveraged to study international migrants. Before I jump into the talk, I want to also mention the works that I will be mentioning today are works I have produced with my wonderful collaborators who are Alina Silbu, Giulio Rossetti, Fosca Gianotti, and also Ile Rapopo from Paris School of Economics. Um, so as I have mentioned quickly, I'll be talking about how Twitter data can be leveraged to study international migrants. But also before going, to, going into the details, I'd like to briefly go through how migrants are defined by international organizations and why studying migrants are important. We'll then go into details of why using Twitter data in this field of study can be useful and what elements from Twitter data can be used in the migration studies. All right. So studying migration is important because migrants touch upon multidimensional aspects of both the host and the home countries. We know that immigrants search for new opportunities in the host countries, which means that economically speaking, both migrants and natives are concerned about employment. Once migrants find a job, they could also be sending money back to their home country, meaning remittances. From the perspective of the society, encouraging successful integration of migrants is beneficial, as this could lead to better standard of living for migrants, but also a harmonious society for the host country. We also have to consider the value of culture that migrants are bringing into the country, including food, language, and so on. So as you can see from the news articles that are coming out these days, immigrants, I mean, the topic of immigration is an important topic for the society of the host, but also the home country. Today, although the movement of individuals have greatly changed due to COVID, the number of individuals who have migrated increased continuously over the years. In the mid 2020, the record from the UN DESA shows that roughly 3.6% of the whole population is composed of migrants who moved to a different country. Of this, 62% were migrant workers and 9.4% were refugees. But who are migrants exactly? Define them is essentially a difficult task because many different definitions can be used. Here I have lined up three different definitions of a migrant from OECD, World Bank and United Nations. The UN, for instance, defines a migrant as a person who moves to a different country other than that of his or her usual residence for a period of at least a year. World Bank focuses on those whose movement across borders is essentially permanent. OECD, on the other hand, tells us that it can be defined on the ground of the place of birth or of the citizenship. These definitions can be further broken down in terms of time, whether it is for permanent or temporary, and on how we define usual place of residence. So following these definitions, where do I stand? So I'm a Korean citizen who used to live in Italy, but is now residing in Germany. Following the definition of the U1, I could be considered as an Italian migrant resident in Germany currently as my usual residence for more than a year 
has been in Italy in the past years. However, following the second definition, I would be considered as a Korean migrant currently residing in Germany based on the um, citizenship status that I have. I have mentioned these because when studying these individuals, the data that we mostly rely on are traditional data sources, such as census, survey, or register data that are collected every 10 years, for instance, for the survey data, which means that most of the cases, they are outdated, but not to mention that they are costly and time consuming to collect. As countries also have their own definition of a migrant, the data is also inconsistent across different countries, and in the worst case scenario, these data are simply not available. On top of things, as countries are more concerned with individuals entering the country, often the quality of data on immigration is far behind the standard. Fortunately today, we are provided with what we call big data, where data comes in various formats, right? That can be images, text, videos or audio from sources such as Twitter, Facebook, CDR, and so on. Most of all, some of them are free. They provide data that is at very fine level with large number of sample size. And hence now casting socks of migrants are possible using this data, not to mention that there are also information and opinions shared by individual users that can be also analyzed for further interesting research questions. So we have decided to exploit these advantages of big data in the study of migration using data science as a new tool. From Twitter, there are several elements that can be used when studying migration. Starting with the profile information, we know that there, are, well, there we have information on name, location, description of the person, also the basic features on Twitter, including number of followers, friends, tweets, and when the account was created. Most of this information, including the location and description is filled in by the number of users themselves. The second part of um, the data that is important for us in the study of migration is the tweet object, of course. It contains all the information embedded in the um, tweets when a user tweets. For example, when the tweet was created, as you can see here in the, in the slide here, created at the text itself, where the tweet was sent from, as well as the language that was written in. Included in the tweet object itself, we have um, also the entity object, which basically synthesizes what is contained in the tweet itself, including the hashtags, URLs, and mentioned user IDs in the tweet. In both of the objects, of course, there are much more information provided, but I have highlighted the most relevant information for the migration statistics. Um, so looking at these two main objects that can be collected from Twitter, there are various ways to collect the data. Using the Twitter API, we can either start from the geotag tweets or from a specific user ID we're interested in. Looking at the geotag tweets, we can stream collections of specific hashtags, for instance, using hashtag migration, migrants, et cetera. Looking at from the specific geolocations, there are options that we can use, um, which are place, country, point radius, and bounding box. Um, if we were to also collect user information, including the social network, there are informations on the followers and friends that we can, we can download as well. Um, there's this other, cool platform called followerwonk.com where you can also search specific user bios and also compare your user account with other celebrities um, Twitter account as well and see what kind of, well, who I follow that are in common with other celebrities, for example. Um, now that also there is the version two of the Twitter API, there are also new features, including um, conversation threads or poll results or pinned tweets on the profile and so on and forth that you can download, which are available now on Twitter API version two. But anyways, using these information, we first wanted to come up with a strategy that can help us in identify migrants on Twitter. So we begun by data collection process where well, from the three month, three month worth of data that Sobig Data Lab, Lab had, we selected geotech users in Italy 
We then obtained the list of friends of these users and also their tweets. Having obtained the data, here we will define a migrant as a person that has the residence different from the nationality. This means that we first identify or assign the resident country of the users. And we do, we do this through looking at the timestamp of their tweets and we count the number of days spent in the country. So for instance, in this um, example here, you can see that the user for the majority of the time stayed in Italy, although this person had traveled to France for a certain period of time, we know that this, for this person, the usual place of residence was Italy in that year. And hence the um, label of resident country was given as Italy for this user. For assigning nationality, we looked at the tweet locations and languages of the user itself and his friends. In this example network, you can see that the user tweets mostly from Italy, but tweets mostly in Korean. Um, I don't know why the, the quality of the image is quite bad, but um, the first row here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the first row here next to the U1 is indicating location. Second row is the language. Um, so after looking at the location and language of the user itself, we also looked at the user's friends, meaning we looked at the frequency of the tweet locations and languages on average. And in this case, we saw that the um, friends of this user mostly, tw mostly tweeted from Korea and mostly tweeted in Korean. And by summing up the total scores of each country for both languages and locations, we obtained the nationality score of the person and here in this example, we obtain the nationality um, as Korean. So by simply comparing these two labels, we know whether this person is a migrant or not. In this case, we know that this person that we inferred identified as a Korean immigrant residing in Italy. Projecting the migration data that we obtained um, on this diagram, we have well, yes, you can see we have many data points in the United States, followed by Great Britain and Italy and so on. Italy in our data was relatively well represented um, because in the first level of users that we selected were um, specific to Italy. Otherwise, in terms of patterns that we can see here is that Italy, for instance, has mostly outgoing links in this bluish color, green color that you can see. Um, whereas countries like US and Great Britain has significant number of both in and outgoing links. Um, other than that, France and Germany, we can see that um, they have mostly incoming links. All right, to next step was to validate the um, strategy that we came up with. And to do so, we performed both the internal and external validation. And first, to internally validate our results, we obtained the gold standard data set for both residents and nationality using the profile information of Twitter. Yeah, of Twitter. For instance, for the residents, we took the profile location as the gold standard data set. On the other hand, for the nationality, we based it on the profile language and the tweet location where the language matches the country in which the language is being spoken. And in this process, we excluded the users with profile language set to English because English may be set by default on Twitter, but also because we consider that English does not have many value in inferring a person's nationality essentially because English is spoken in various different countries, you know, states, Great Britain, New Zealand, Australia, and so on. Anyways, the point is that the performance score here shows a good accuracy level of our predicted data on gold standard data set with almost 0.86 of F1 score on the residence label and 0.99 on the nationality versus the gold standard data set. To further confirm, well, validate our results with the ground truth data, we looked at the Italian residents residing in different countries abroad versus the Italian registered data called IRE and Eurostat. A first interesting remark, um, which 
unfortunately not stated here in the in the slide, but something that we remarked was that even between the official statistics themselves, the numbers did not match completely. And the correlation between the two official data sets that we obtained was 0 0.91. Secondly, in the top two, well, in the in the top row, we see the um, we we observe a good agreement between our predictions and the official data for European countries. First is the IRA data, and second is the Eurostat data, um, with well correlation coefficient of zero point eight three. While looking at IRA data, the Italian register data, and zero point seven six while looking at the Eurostat data. However, for the non-European countries, the correlation with the Italian registered data dropped to 0.56. And we believe that this happened because of the um, different usage of Twitter that is not as high as in um, European countries or in America. In countries such as Korea, the Twitter usage is not as high as in America, for instance, who has the highest Twitter population in the world. Continuing with the data that we just obtained containing information on whether users are migrants or not, we were further interested in studying the level of cultural integration of migrants. Um, to be more specific, here we were interested in studying whether migrants observe culture of their destination society but also whether they lose connection with their home country. To answer these questions, we came up with a novel method to compute what we call home and destination attachment indexes using hashtags. To study cultural integration, traditional studies focus on elements such as language proficiency, marital status, and sometimes also the role of media, for instance, how much you watch the local news channels. But here the goal was that, well, to put it in a simple picture, the mechanism that we had was that if a migrant in Italy, for instance, is engaging in a discussion about Salvini, this means that he or she is aware of the political situation in Italy and can thus provide us an indication of how much the migrant knows about the country, right? And furthermore, on top of this information, we categorize the two indexes that I mentioned, home and destination, destination attachment indexes on the various fourfold model of acculturation, which are assimilation, integration, marginalization, and separation. In the two extreme cases, it means that the assimilation means a complete accommodation of the majority characteristics of the society, whereas separation means complete distinction from the majority society. To put these in our terms, integration or assimilation depends upon whether you embrace the host country's culture or you keep the culture of your home country. So the method was the following. So having identified the migrants on Twitter, we looked at how to determine whether the hashtags were country specific topics or not. So here we define the dictionary where we store probability distribution of a hashtag across different countries of natives for each hashtag. And provided with this distribution, we computed the entropy of each hashtag normalized by the number of elements in the dictionary. In order to determine whether a hashtag is a country specific or not, we said an entropy stable uh, entropy threshold equal to 0 0.5, meaning that we are assigning hashtags with entropy score above the threshold as international topics and hashtags below the threshold as country specific topics, taking the country with the largest value in the distribution as a national label. So in this example of Salvini, as you can see that the um, well country, the, country of natives that mostly spoke about this hashtag was from Italy. And the entropy score for this Salvini hashtag was 0.11, which means that this was um, clearly um, identified as Italian specific hashtag. Um, other than Salvini, we also identified hashtags such as Immigrazione, Caffè, Renzi, and Trenitalia as Italian specific topics. Trump, EU, immigration as international topics. 
Um, with the obtained labels of hashtag, we, what we did afterwards was to build the two indexes that I mentioned, which are basically measured by looking at how much you are interested in the topics of your country of residence for the destination attachment index and how much you are interested in the topic of your country of origin, AKA the home attachment index. So basically for both of the indexes, we are looking at the proportion of country specific hashtags that either belong to the country of residence or the origin. Um, but of course we had to validate the method and to do this, we computed, well, we did the non-model analysis where we compared the values um, of our indexes with the non-model where the hashtags of individual users were randomly redistributed five times. Um, this would essentially tell us um, what the index value would be if the users chose their topics of discussion randomly. In other words, whether there were any, well, no influence from the country of residence or the nationality. To go straight to the answer, the non-model values were smaller than the actual values. Um, and the Wilcoxon and KS test that we computed also confirmed us that indeed the normal model values were statistic statistically different from the actual values. So having confirmed that our method was good and our indexes were indeed reflecting um, the reality, um, we then computed the, well, we plotted a scatter plot between be the DA and home attachment indexes to reflect the relationship between the two. So in this plot here, what we want to highlight here is that we can observe different patterns of um, different migrants in our data, leading to different integration types as shown in the um, table that I showed you at the beginning. Meaning that the red curve here um, is an approximate indication of users integration type. The, the integration and marginalization here depends on the length of the distance from the data point from zero. In other words, marginalization is when the data point is close to zero and integration is when the data point is further away from zero. The data point here circled in green in this slide um, would be an example of an integrated migrant. With the two indexes that we computed, we also looked at various factors. For the sake of this presentation, I'm gonna only show you well, interesting, well, more interesting um, pictures that I have um, produced in this work. But of course, for the further details, you can check out the paper. Um, the further, well, first factor that we looked at was um, the language proficiency, the relationship between our indices and the language um, proficiency. As I mentioned, it is considered as a key factor to integration. And here we observe that the group that speaks the language integrates more than the other group. And on the other hand, the group that do not speak the language show higher home attachment level, which means that our indexes further confirms the significance of the language for the integration of immigrants in the host country. In, other, well, in addition to this, it shows also the relationship between the language and the home attachment level to the culture of the home country, which has not been studied much in the literature. Um, other things that we also looked into was um, specific country cases. Um, here again, sorry, um, the image quality is very bad, but I will explain it to you in words. Um, so here we're looking at, um, Italian immigrants resident in different countries. Um, in the left figure here, the box plots um, are, dis well, are showing DA and HA, HA indexes at a country level for Italian immigrants. And essentially allows us to observe how well Italian immigrants are doing in different countries. And overall, we observe that Italians are attached, more attached to their home country than integrated in their host country. Um, Switzerland, Belgium, and Netherlands are the three countries where Italians are being more attached to home country. Essentially in this plot is actually the orange boxes indicating home attachment levels. 
Italians, on the other hand, tend to do relatively well in English speaking countries um, as the DA level um, are at highest in English speaking countries such as the United States and um, the UK. And although the DA level is not as high as in English speaking countries, Italians tend to do well also in neighboring countries such as Spain. And as you can see in the figure on the right, um, Italian immigrants are mostly skewed towards the integration type of separation. Um, to quickly summarize this work, um, we were able to carry out a cross-country study of cultural integration. Geographic areas of studies. Um, we were also able to build new indexes using hashtags as a new element to measure cultural integration. In the last paper that I want to present today is that, um, well, here we were interested in exploring characteristics of different communities of users on Twitter, i.e. migrants and natives. Again, here we're using the same data set that we constructed um, from the beginning. So basically, um, here we were interested in studying whether migrants and natives have distinctive characteristics or behaviors on Twitter. So we began by looking at features that can be easily observed from data, i.e. tweets in this case. And we see that migrants, well, we observe that migrants tend to have, well, send out more tweets in a wider and variety of languages and locations and natives. And interestingly, the same picture was also reflected on the friends of migrants um, and natives where um, friends of migrants were tweeting in a wider and variety of languages and locations and natives. Again, on top of this, what was interesting was that this variety was also reflected on the topics that they were talking about on Twitter. Um, in this spider web, um, you can see that for instance, migrants, they mostly use hashtags that are things like travel, country, TBT, which means throwback Thursday, and summer. Whereas for natives, hashtags like job, um, art, love, that are I think she had a problem. <laughs> yeah, it's not, I, I see in the chat box, some of you is asking, um, no, it is, I think she had a problem because we are all here. So let's see if she would be able to, to join again. Yeah. So it seems, yeah. Sorry about that. This is the reason why we should go back to face-to-face -face meetings.
trying to see if <laughs> I don't know if yeah it's, it's for everyone yeah face to face as the best bandwidth <laughs> yeah definitely Sorry about that. I see somebody joining. Not sure. Is Jesus? No. Yeah, she sent uh, an email saying she's trying to reconnect. Okay, she's back. Hello. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Sorry for the <laughs> inconvenience. Can That's you guys hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. And I think you must be able to share your screen again. Okay. Sorry for the trouble. It's okay. All right, I'm just glad that I'm back on live. Um, so I'm not I, sure where I was cut off. I think we didn't see this slide. Yeah, then? Yeah, yeah, this one. Here? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me, let me take a sip of water. <laughs> Panic there for a second. <laughs> but I'm back, so I'll continue from this slide. Um, so I was saying that interestingly, um, the variety, the difference between the migrants and natives that we were observing on the um, tweets was also reflected on the hashtags that we're using. Um, so the migrants were using mostly hashtags such as summer, um, travel, country, TBT, which means throwback Thursday, um, hence the hashtags that are more related to vacation kind of mood, whereas natives were using hashtags such as jobs, um, art, love, veteran, the terms that are more down to earth related um, terms. Um, so in this paper, lastly, we also wanted to understand the social network, how um, migrants and natives um, connect with other users on Twitter. And to understand this mechanism, we computed the local homophily level based on the three attributes that we had in the data, which are the um, label of the residence, nationality, and also whether this user is a migrant or not, migrant native label. And here we observe that migrant users tend to consider less the country of residence when following the other users, whereas natives tend to connect with other users residing in the same country, looking at the first um, plot here in this slide. In the second plot, however, um, we see that there is a stronger tendency to follow nationality labels 
when creating social links for migrants. And lastly, we observe a completely different picture when looking at the um, migrant or native label and tells us that migrants tend to connect with natives rather than other migrants on Twitter. So to quickly wrap up, um, in today's presentation, I showed how Twitter data can be leveraged to study migration. From the data that it contained information on users and their tweets, we were able to identify migrants and study cultural integration levels of these users as well as their characteristics. I want to, however, point out that um, there are limitations of using Twitter data. First, we had to take extra care of ethics and privacy related issues in the data that we were handling, meaning that we had to go through extensive data processing to pseudonize the data set. Um, we also had, well, we also have the issue of the selection bias and we clearly, our results cannot be generalized to the rest of the population due to this fact. Lastly, due to the number, well, li limited number of geotag tweets, although we started off with many users, we were not able to identify satisfying number of migrants. Um, to be more exact, uh, we had, we started off um, about 250,000 users, but among those users, we were only able to identify about 3,000 migrant users. We then at certain stage extended the data set to a second level of data set, which you can find in more details in our articles. But even then with more data, we had only about 5,000 migrants that we were able to identify on Twitter data. Um, nevertheless, I believe that thanks to the social media data, we were now able to study interesting phenomena that were not able to do so before. And social media data, of course, certainly is useful when generating provisional estimates that can be revised when official statistics become available. So the goal in my future works is to complement the traditional data with digital, digital trace data that, to take the advantages of both sides of the data sources. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Sorry for the quality of the images and for the internet trouble that I had in the middle of the presentation, but I hope the presentation was clear enough. Um, feel free to contact me otherwise for further questions. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jisoo. And uh, yeah, definitely. We need to solve this problem of internet connection, restarting our meetings in person. I said this when you disappear. <laughs> <laughs> So, Thank God I was able to come back though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, any question? Feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand or use the chat box. Any of this? Ovidio. I have a ton of questions, um, but um, I will limit myself to just a few. Uh, so, so the others can um, raise theirs. So I, I missed the beginning of your presentation um, in especially on, on the Twitter data and how you are going to extract the location. Are you just using the metadata or parsing the location in the tweets as well? Um, if, if someone is saying I'm, I'm visiting this particular place. Um, so essentially, no, actually, in our data, what we did was um, initially I was provided with the three months worth of tweets right. from my previous lab. So here you go. Um, so from the three months worth of data that I had initially, I selected out the geotag users in Italy. And right. then, yeah, we kind of went backwards because we wanted to, well, we had to start from somewhere. And we had this data from the Sobic data lab, so we wanted to take advantage of this data, right? But then at the 
stage where we were downloading friends, Jira tag users, of course, the Jira locations of all of these users were out of Italy. Um, and of course, when we started downloading the timelines of these individual users, although they were in Italy, when we were um, selecting out at the beginning of the stage, um, they were actually in different countries in the later um, years. So actually, because of that, the data set kind of enlarged to um, world level. But initially, actually, um, we were focusing on Italian well, migrants in Italy. Right. Yeah. Okay. I, I had a similar issue for, for a previous project, and I, I wanted to see if you found a, a good solution for, for that problem. No, I mean, I mean, you know how it is with the Twitter data set. I'm again downloading a Twitter data set for a different project also, and I, you know, somehow forgot the fact that geolocated tweets are not that many. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm again facing this, um, you know, scarcity of geotag locations of tweets. And this is something that you also have to kind of, you know, find a solution to fill in the gap that you have in the geolocations that you have. As in like okay. in the residence, um, when we were identifying the residence process, you know, this is an example that I saw in our data set where we have geolocated tweets in Italy for several months in the year, but then undefined tweets, meaning we don't have any information on the location for a few months or something. And yeah. then suddenly in France, what do we do? We have to you know, acknowledge this fact. And anyways, from the data set, we understand that this person was in Italy for the majority of the time, right? Which fits the definition that we set for the usual residence. So this is the way I mean, this is the strategy that we took to care of that actually, yeah. I mean, in, in my case, that actually helped me uh, in my project because I was building travel maps uh, and mm. I wanted more dy dynamic data. Uh, but in, uh, in your case, I understand that's a problem. Uh, okay, so I have one last question for today. Uh, I will definitely send you a message uh, to, sure. to discuss more. Uh, and then I will let Mark ask his question because I think he raised his hand. Um, so I'm, I'm curious how you solve um, language detection when you have, especially with migrants, where I, I believe they, they would communicate in mixed languages sometimes. So what do you do in that case? Well, that's why for the languages, actually, in our case, because we were looking at the languages to define the nationality in our case, actually. And we see that this is, sorry for the, again, for the quality of the image, but here you can see is in the example, you know, this user one was using French. Actually, this is my example, <laughs> because you can also, I mean, I speak also French a little bit. I was in Italy, so I was tweeting a little bit on in Italian also, but I'm Korean. And you see this dynamic of language usage that I use in the Twitter itself, right? But then in our case, it definitely worked out that this information because in any ways, showing that there's little possibility of using other language was an indication that this person has or might have a connection with that country. So we actually use that information as an advantage in our strategy. I don't know if that okay. was clear. Okay, well, if you have mixed languages in the same tweet, uh, do you do anything special about that or not at all? If I had, sorry? mixed languages in the same tweet. So uh, someone tweeting well, half of the tweet in French and half mm -hmm. in Italian. Well, yeah, no, in this case, we relied on the Twitter API, what the data they were giving us. So if there was no, I guess okay. I'm, I'm guessing they wouldn't have any tweet language label for that data, then we simply neglected it. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jisoo. And Mark? Yeah, so I, I think I would just say overall to start that, I mean, it's, I, I wasn't sure what to expect, but I, I think if I could sum it up, it's what you're doing is really interesting and clever because trying to figure out how to get who are migrants and what kind of migrants they are is, is actually just sort of barely possible from, from tweet data. 
if you're clever and resourceful and apply kind of what you know about what it means to be a migrant, which is what you've done. Um, and so now that's fantabulous, you know, and from the standpoint of social science, you'd go, yes, that's how we do it. But like computer scientists would be like, we hate this, okay, because you have all this sort of domain knowledge that you've had to use and there's not just some like magic algorithm that says, oh, boom, we know this is that. And, and whilst you can maybe use sort of the magic of data simulation, stroke data learning to kind of work backwards from the limited number of tweets that you have that are geotagged to those that aren't, you don't have very many geotagged um, tweets, you know, like in general, one to 2%, right? So I guess what I'm wondering about is like, if you were trying to generalize these methods to a different kind of like migration, um, not, not like uh, country to country, but a migration on a, let's say, a position that you take with respect to a social movement that's happening, you know, where you live. Um, could you do the same thing there or would it just get kind of like impossibly messy with figuring out what the rules or, you know, what data you would turn to, to make the most of what you had? Essentially, I would say that it won't be that much complicated, actually. I mean, I'm not sure. So I let's don't know say, if you let's can say that you're an anti-vaxxer, okay? Mm -hmm. and, um, and we're trying to figure out, do you migrate to being a vaxxer? Like what, what kind of conceptually in your framework, what sort, how would you map the things that you did to, to tackle something like that? Not that you have to have an answer, by the way. I'm just curious about <laughs> how, how you think about it because you're you're deep into yeah. this, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I would definitely, in this case, I don't know, look into, of course, I have to look into the tweets. That's like the main information yeah, sure. that I can use, right? Um, thinking about the methods that I developed, I am thinking maybe we could, again, kind of apply this part of um, my research using the cultural integration mm -hmm. part mm -hmm. again I mean here I'm looking at nationality country specific hashtags but this can be again applied to I don't know some movement specific hashtags right easily yeah exactly that we can easily detag from Twitter using the trending topics or whatever this can be I think it can be easily applied and say okay migrants what are the related movements um, concerning migrants? I'm not sure about what the hot topic where would is you get days, the, but anyways. Where would you get the authoritative take on you know, whether a hashtag is sort of movement specific? So I, I completely agree that, that that will work brilliantly, but mm -hmm. um, it might be, uh, might be hard to construct. Actually, it is actually. Um, so before this paper was formatted as it is now, Initially, we were thinking of, you know, focusing on specific hashtags. Let's see what Salvini movement is giving us in Italy kind of specific movements. But then the issue was that actually exactly that we weren't sure which hashtags to look at exactly. I mean, if it's kind of trending at the moment, you know that because you can see it in the trending topics. But if it's a past movement, of course, you can see very famous hashtags sure. on the news itself. But a minor movements or political movements, it's hard to kind yeah, of remember yeah. what the you know trending but hashtags are. But I think I think you're right that this this element of what you did has a lot of applicability to a you know a bunch of other things, mm -hmm. and and the bigger the issue like you know vaccination around the pandemic, the more likely it is that the tags that you you know would want would be few in number and relatively accessible. Um, yeah. in, in which case this this could work pretty pretty well so definitely yep um yeah cool thanks for sharing you know we might <laughs> we might be kind of chasing you down to say hmm what do you think about xyz so anyway cool thanks perfect i'll love to hear back from you thank you for the comments and questions thank you again jesu thank you mark and uh, other question comment for jesu So I, I have a couple of questions, but it's uh, one was the same that 
as the last question of Mark, like uh, in terms of generability. But other questions were, um, uh, one, just by curiosity, then by your definition, are you an Italian immigrant or a Korean immigrant? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a tricky question, isn't it? <laughs> Coming from you especially. <laughs> Let's say I follow the OECD definition. <laughs> <laughs> you are a difficult case, right? <laughs> I am actually. That's why I like been... exactly. That's why I mean, I gave a lot of Italian topic examples because I know that you're there. You invited me for this talk, but also because I like the topics that it, you know. I've done a lot of talks on this topic. Most of the time, I give an example on the pizza, <laughs> as in like Italians won't be eating Hawaiian pizza over you know Napolitan pizza, for instance. That's clearly a home attachment in our case, right? Yeah, <laughs> it is. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, and uh, yeah, then um, uh, more by curiosity, a technical question, but it's more a curiosity. If you go back to slide, I think 15, mm -hmm. yes. So I, I was curious to understand, so for example, the not blue let's say more purple color from the us yeah mm -hmm. what is that these so uh, okay so these are actually outgoing links from us to great britain for instance so these are the americans going to the great britain yeah so, so I, I i understood well then and uh, yeah it was surprising for me because i didn't expect so many, US is a big country, so. It is actually, but bear in mind using Twitter data, again, this is a bit biased because there are a lot of American populations in on Twitter. Yeah. So this could be reflecting that majority of the time, actually. So for from what you are saying, this means that you probably didn't balance the data it is unbalanced actually it's from unbalanced. the perspective um of the nationalities that we detected per se as in like um so these are technically from my data would mean that these are the nationality of americans well mm -hmm. american nationalities now resident in the great britain in the period that we observed which I could see. be partially true but in any ways the picture that I wanted to highlight from this picture is that um, the general trend of the migration, we would understand that from this picture as well, as in um, like the fact that uh, France and Germany, for instance, are the countries that are receiving most of the links, well, mm. meaning receiving a lot of migrants. Mm. Um, United States, for instance, are also sending out a lot of people outside, but also receiving a lot of migrants. Mm. which is in general if i can say is reflecting the general migration trend that each different countries are um well receiving kind of way yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i see it, but it will be probably interesting um trying to plot the same data balancing with respect to the number of tweets yeah actually yeah that's true um, so to but yeah super interesting Thank, Thank you. you. Any, any other final question before we close the meeting? And uh, yeah, as I said to Jeeves at the beginning of uh, this meeting, uh, we are hopefully meeting in person in June. As this year, the um, workshop we organize every year for machine learning, data simulation, dynamical systems uh, will be held um, as always by the International Conference of Computational Science in London. So uh, looking forward to meeting people in person. I'm sending in the chat again the link in case you are interested in submitting uh, an abstract or a short paper, seven pages, or long paper, 14 pages. And as the um, International Conference on Computational Science is a top conference uh, and the publication is on lecture notes in computer science, uh, 
especially for uh, postdocs and PhD students, this is a good point uh, in terms of publication if you are if you have that in the CV. So your contributions are welcome. And especially, I'm really looking forward to meeting people in person. <laughs> so yeah. But thanks again for joining the meeting today. Thanks, Jisoo, for the talk. And uh, speak soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Zella. Thank you, bye. Grazie per l'opportunità. <laughs> it was really cool. Grazie a te. Ciao. Ciao.